A show that tackles the big issues affecting the BVI and the rest of the Caribbean. Searches for answers to today's big questions and gives viewers a unique perspective on developing stories. Follow the big story with me, Kathy Richards, only on GTV. This show is brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, Cyril B. Romney Tertola Pier Park, NV Salon Nail Spa and Barbershop, Tisley Cross Deliciously Smooth Cider, and Digicel Simply More Speed, Reliability and Entertainment. Tisley Cross Cider. Tisley Cross Cider. Deliciously smooth. His political journey. All throughout my political life, I believe I've been doubted quite a bit. Premier Dr. The Honorable Natalio D. Whitley. On this special edition of The Big Story. The late Honorable Willard Wheatley, MBE, LLD, forever celebrated as a former politician and educator. He served two consecutive terms as the Chief Minister of the Territory from 1971 to 1979. For the, he was the first ever Minister of Finance for the Virgin Islands. Fast forward 43 years. The Whitley blood sits in the top seat of the territory as Premier and Minister of Finance in the person of a Dr. Natalio Whitley, grandson of the late Honorable Willard Whitley. Well, of course, my grandfather, um, we are very proud of him, very proud that he helped to get us off grant in aid. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's interesting, I would say it's, it's God's uh, blessings that I have the opportunity to try to keep us in a situation where we have our own Minister of Finance. Um, certainly uh, the inspiration to become a politician is really to help people. Um, I remember growing up and watching commercials with uh, this lady named Sally Struthers. I'm not sure if you remember Sally Struthers, but she used to do these commercials and tell you about all of the, the starving people in, in Ethiopia at the time. It was either Ethiopia or Somalia. Uh, when they were going through their, their famine they were going through and persons were, were having a difficult time then. I'd always ask myself, uh, I wonder why people in the world have to suffer in that way. And I always wanted to do something to help those people. And I just think that I was born with a spirit to want to help persons. Um, and that has taken me all throughout my life. And of course, uh, being inspired, but not, ju not just by my, my grandfather, um, but by other persons who have served our community. The story and the journey of us going from, of course, a slave colony, um, of course, to following slavery, um, doing all that we could to build an economy and to build a life here, you know, uh, the way that we were together, um, that's a legacy that I respect and it's a legacy that I want to protect. And also I'm inspired because I see a, a, a very positive future for the Virgin Islands and I want to be a part of creating it. It was during his years at various universities that he developed a passion for politics. I went to Clark Atlanta University and of course I, I learned a lot about myself and learned a lot about the world while I was there. And that journey continued when I went to Purdue University. I was at Clark in 1997 and I graduated in 2001. I did my master's degree at Purdue in 2001 and I graduated in 2003. And then very significantly I went over to the United Kingdom in 2003 and I left there in 2006. And while I was at, in London I, I got very politically active and very much politically involved. And when I left London and came to the Virgin Islands, I wanted to bring that same kind of activism uh, back home with me to the Virgin Islands. And I started, I started getting involved in, uh, one of the first things I got involved in was the fight to save Beef Island. At the time there were some golf courses uh, that they were supposed to be putting in the area called Hands Creek. 
and it would have damaged the environment. And I got together with some other concerned citizens, and we had that fight uh, for Beef Island. And of course, um, I started to be on the radio at that time. I used to appear with um, you know someone who was on JTV quite a lot, which is Cromwell Eduenka Smith. Uh, we would uh, appear uh, not only on the radio, but we would also appear on JTV as well, on his program on JTV. And I was very active on the radios at that time. Uh, when the Virgin Islands Party came to office in 2007, of course, um, there are some issues that I disagreed with uh, with that administration. And, and probably the, the biggest one I disagreed with was the Bywater contract. And I, again, I got very politically active. I, I, I did matches, etc. And um, we fought against that. Continuing the legacy of committing to doing his part for the greater good of the Virgin Islands, so one day who rule, as many still call him, takes us on a trip down memory lane, his political journey. When the 2011 uh, elections rolled around, uh, because I had challenges with, at that time, uh, both administrations, I thought it best for me to get politically involved and to stand for election. And we had a group, that the group started off um, as a very big group, lots of persons in the room, even persons now who uh, have um, subsequently run for, for office and some of them who've actually won. Uh, we got into, into the room and we formed a group called the People's Patriotic Alliance. You know, even though we had a, lots of candidates at one point, it ended up having only about four candidates, and that included Shana Smith, Elton Callwood, Coy Smith, and myself. And we formed the People's Patriotic Alliance. Of course, we didn't have a chance at all, but actually I thought quite a number of persons voted for us despite the fact that we didn't have a full slate, and at that time we were very, very young and probably didn't even know what we didn't know. Um, but we had a positive message for the people about change and about um, moving forward, about even you know how we deal with some practices, the way that we've been dealing with them for the last 20 or 30 years, and you know proposing change and a shift. Um, so when we were unsuccessful in that elections, of course I. I continued, you know, of course, working at the college and all of the other things I was doing in my life. Um, the National Democratic Party was in power at that time. Um, and, of course, I disagreed with, with a few things that they were doing as well. Um, and I continued, I would say, my political activism and, and, and being a champion for certain things, um, still appearing on the radio, etc. And, of course, when 2015 rolled around again, I threw my hat in the ring. And this time, I threw my hat in the ring with Alvin Christopher and the People's Empowerment Party. And similarly, we did not have a full slate. Uh, it was Laurie Reimer, myself, um, Elford Parsons, Alvin Christopher, uh, Faye Reese, and um, I may be uh, forgetting one or two persons, but it was maybe about five of us. And again, uh, we went through the elections, and uh, we were not successful. And in that time, I knew we weren't going to be successful on polling day. Um, and after um, being unsuccessful in the 2015 elections, um, I chose to join the Virgin Islands Party. Of course, my cousin, um, Calvin Malone, Honorable Calvin Malone, uh, who was president of the party at the time, wanted me to join the party and become the, and become the president. And so I joined, I became the president of the party. Um, and of course, you know, that's where my journey began with the Virgin Islands Party. Um, and we helped to revive the party after, of course, they only had two members in, in parliament at the time. And uh, when 2019 rolled around, of course, I, I wanted to, to run again. But this time, as opposed to running at large, I, I ran it at large in 2011 and 2015. Um, I wanted to run in a district, of course. 
uh, because of course I, I live in the 7th district, I saw quite a number of needs in the 7th district and of course I wanted to be able to, to contest this time in the 7th district and of course I was successful. Even from when I was with the PPA and when I was with the PEP, the message has always been changed. The message has always been we need to take a good look at what we've been doing in the past and I believe people in the 7th district and, and in the community were hungry for change. All throughout my political life I believe I've been doubted quite a bit. A lot of persons say I, I, I never had a chance, you know, why even try? But I always had faith in God that God had a destiny for me. Uh, God has been preparing me um, for something perhaps even I'm only beginning to fully understand and I was successful which was perhaps one of the biggest shocks if not the biggest shocks of the 2019 elections. The first three years of this administration perhaps we didn't deliver on the change that uh, people really wanted and I see it as an opportunity right now to really capitalize on the real fundamental change that that people want to see in their politics. Seated as one of the five decision makers of cabinet, Dr. Whitley was appointed a deputy premier after all his other colleagues were given a taste of the seat. A major shift from being an activist and teacher to that of a government minister. A challenging transition? It was a challenge uh, because of course many persons knew me to be an activist. And as an activist and a politician, the rules are, are somewhat um, different. As an activist, you can say really whatever it is on, is on your mind, and you're only really representing one particular position. But as a politician, you have to think of all the different stakeholders that you have to manage relationships with, and you have to speak to the interests of every single person as opposed to just representing one particular point of view. And some persons would look at it as, as though somehow you're selling out or you're no longer an activist, you no longer have that fire or passion to defend the people. But it's not that, of course, when you're a politician, every single word you say um, is something that's being evaluated. Even right now, um, every single word I say in public is being listened to by the people of the Virgin Islands, by the United Kingdom government, by governments across the world, by you know the international business community. So you have to be very extremely responsible with the words that you say. And in the past, if, if I felt like you know saying something and, and this should happen or that should happen, I would just I would just say it. So I would say um, there's a journey of growth and maturity. Of course, I'm still passionate about a lot of the things I used to fight for before, but sometimes you go about the battle in a different type of way to ensure that you can get a better result. Three years, three months into the four-year term with Dr. Whitley as a member of the Virgin Islands Cabinet, tides changed. The circumstances that led to me becoming Premier are sad and disappointing, of course, with um, Honorable Foy's um, arrest in, in, in Miami. But actually, um, all of these events, I think, uh, really speak to me that, of course, God has a plan for me and he's been preparing me for, for this particular moment all my life. And, and I intend not to disappoint the people of the Virgin Islands. I intend to walk in my destiny and uh, we are seeking um, very much so to hold on to our democracy. So I know the role that I play along with my colleagues is very important right now. This happened as the territory was biting nails, awaiting the release of the report of the Commission of Inquiry, with Foy behind the bars, Governor Rankin released. The world heard among 45 recommendations that of a temporary partial suspension of the Virgin Islands Constitution for an initial two-year period. The people took to the streets while Dr. Wheatley, with special envoy of the Virgin Islands government and the premier's advisor on international relations by his side, his brother Benito Wheatley, 
headed into talks with top UK officials. We had very good meetings with Governor Rankin and Minister Millen. Uh, we're grateful to them that they came and they were able to listen to not only us as elected representatives of the, of the people of the Virgin Islands, but also they listened to different stakeholder groups in the community. Of course, they expressed to us that they were very concerned about the content of the Commission of Inquiry report. And of course, they believe very firmly um, that the recommendations were something that some, some uh, things that needed to be implemented in the best interest of the Virgin Islands. And we, we agreed. Uh, we agreed that, of course, the issues pointed out in the report uh, need attention, urgent attention, and drastic attention. And we had the commitment of not only myself as, at the time, acting premier, uh, and uh, at the time, members of the opposition, um, all, all of us um, elected representatives made a firm commitment to implement the recommendations because we believe the people of the Virgin Islands do deserve better governance. As you said, in terms of the partial suspension of the Constitution, uh, those are things that uh, just about everyone I've spoken to uh, disagreed, disagrees with. Of course, you may have one or two persons angry about something or the other who says, yes, suspend the Constitution. But our ancestors, were, including my grandfather, worked too hard. You know, they sweat too much. They, you know, blood, sweat, and tears to get us to this point. And we cannot allow it to be taken away. Um, of course, uh, we have some challenges that we have to overcome. And I'm confident we're able to do so because we have good people here in the Virgin Islands. And of course, under new direction and new leadership, I'm sure we can get this done. Dr. Whitley was appointed Premier of the Virgin Islands on Thursday, May 5, 2022, after a number of swift actions by the Congress of the Virgin Islands Party, VIP, they voted out Andrew Foy as chairman and appointed Whitley to the post. This action was followed by an agreement with the opposition to form a national unity government with Whitley as Premier. Honorables Carvin Malone and Vincent Wheatley stepped down from their ministerial posts, making way for two opposition members to enter cabinet. Honorables Marlon A. Penn, now Minister for Health and Social Development, and Melvin Mitch Turnbull, Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration. Honorable Shari B. De Castro, appointed Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs and Sports. From the very beginning, uh, from when I heard the news about uh, Honorable Foy uh, and I got the news from the governor and to when we got the Commission of Inquiry report published, I was in constant communication with Honorable Marlon Penn and other members of the then opposition. And we had discussions, we got on the same page very early um, concerning the fact that we did not want a partial um, or any type of suspension of our constitution and we had a number of meetings uh, coming up with aligning our positions uh, to go before Minister Millen and, and Governor Ranking and of course um, they put forward uh, they certainly can can take the credit for that they put forward the idea of the national unity government which was well received by Governor Rankin and Minister Millen, of course, because we want to be able to show that the, we don't have the partisan divide, uh, that, that pa um, partisan politics will not play a role in terms of how we implement these recommendations that will be done in the best interests of the people of the Virgin Islands. Of course, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, of course, when you come from different political parties who may have varying political ideologies, but uh, we're all relatively young people. Uh, we are familiar with each other. In fact, we're very friendly uh, with each other and uh, we've worked with each other in different capacities in the past and I'm quite confident that we'll be able to work out any differences we have because it's important to put any differences aside in the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. Being selected as a Deputy Premier and then becoming the Acting Premier, I believe, you know, put me uh, in the position uh, to be able to assume leadership at the particular time. And of course, I believe that I have 
um, intelligence, I have characteristics, and I have um, abilities that will make me suitable. Now, of course, we have other persons who are suitable as well, um, but in, in all of these things, of course, it requires every single person to have a certain level of confidence in you, and they express that in me, and I'm grateful for the confidence that they expressed in me. And I also have confidence in others. Of course, um, one of my uh, first recommendations was to recommend uh, Honorable Kai Reimer uh, to be the Deputy Premier. And that's because I have a great confidence in him. That I, if I'm unable to, to, to execute the duties of Premier, that he will be able to step in and do so. And we have other persons who are capable as well. Um, so certainly I'm grateful to have been given the opportunity I'm humbled by it. I'm um, humbled by the confidence that my colleagues have expressed in me, and certainly I won't. I won't let them down. And of course, um, you know, I think right now is not a time for persons to think about personal ambitions. It's it's time to think about what we can do uh, for the people of the Virgin Islands. And of course, persons' personal ambitions. There, there's time and, and place for that. But we have a a country to save right now. But are these moves enough to restore the confidence of Virgin Islands people in a government? No, it's not enough. Um, the people of the Virgin Islands need swift action uh, to restore their confidence. And we've already started in that direction with a few moves that we have made already, including the formation of a national unity government. Persons reacted very well to that because persons have been asking us for a very long time to, to start fighting against each other. And, and to come together and fight for the Virgin Islands. And that helped persons to feel some level of confidence. Of course, we, we made a move as well as it pertains to the speaker. Um, the speaker uh, resigned. We thank him for his sacrifice in, in resigning. Uh, because, of course, all members of the House of Assembly were not comfortable with how he presided in the House. And we just thought it was time for a new start. And um, so we'll, we'll be soon selecting an, a new speaker, but we, we, we are grateful for the service that the speaker gave to the people of the Virgin Islands. In his capacity, he does have some accomplishments under his belt, but we thought it was time to, to move in a new direction. And of course, we have other things that will be announced over the next coming days. Will this coalition government survive after all the cabinet now has the two opposition members? Yes, it will survive, but for it to survive, we all have to put country force. And that's what we have been saying to the people of the Virgin Islands, and that's what we have to truly believe and to internalize. It will only work, it will only be successful if we can uh, let self take a step back and for country to take a step forward. I know that we have the skills, I know that we have the intelligence, I know that we have the character, I know that we have the ideas, and all we have to do is make sure we don't allow anyone undermine the unity which we have created in which the people of the Virgin Islands love. I've gotten so much positive feedback about the step we've taken, and persons are so happy about the unity. It has, it has created fresh hope, a, a renewed sense of hope in the Virgin Islands, and we cannot let our people down. To date, Governor Rankin has not said anything new regarding the Commission of Inquiry recommendations. So is partial constitution suspension and UK direct governance are still on the table? And will the 45 recommendations be implemented by the new coalition government? It, well, I should say that it has not been taken off the table because Minister Millen uh, listened to us and we're grateful for her listening. And she has to report back to the Foreign Secretary and to the United Kingdom government, and then a decision will be made. And we're just hopeful and prayerful, and of course persons uh, should send emails, they should do whatever it is that they can do to let persons in the United Kingdom know that we do not favor a partial suspension of our Constitution. All of us have to get involved now, and we can't leave it to chance. We need to send a message that we do not favor the partial suspension of our Constitution. Um, and of course, we have committed to implementing the recommendations. 
uh, because we believe that will help us to, to be able not just to, to please the United Kingdom or please Minister Millen or the Foreign Secretary Liz Trust, but to really please our people, to give them confidence that we can establish a framework of good governance, accountability, transparency, value for money, uh, quali quality, efficiently run public services, etc. More than the 44, we also have other recommendations that have to do with constitutional reform and other things. The, 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 the recommendation that we have a real challenge with is the partial suspension of the Constitution. And it's important for us to go through the recommendations uh, one by one and to have a discussion uh, with the governor. Uh, and this is a part of the proposal that we're submitting to the United Kingdom for their consideration, a process of going through each recommendation and discussing in collaboration with the United Kingdom, with our uh, locally appointed governor, and with the people of the Virgin Islands about how we move forward with these recommendations. With all the events that unfolded since the arrest of Foy, was there any direct communication with present and ex-premiers? Due to his circumstances, it's difficult to speak with him. He doesn't have any form of communication. Of course, there was a decision made by the courts in Miami uh, that he would be released on, on bail. Um, that decision has been challenged and he remains in detention at this particular moment of course. Um, I'm not sure um, what level of communication uh, we will have but I, I just want to let the people of the Virgin Islands know uh, despite to what he has alleged to have committed, uh, despite um, all of the, the ways in which the Virgin Islands is, is challenged because of of, of what he is alleged to have been involved in. He's a human being. Um, certainly, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with him and with his family, especially his family, especially his mother, who is mourning the loss of, of her daughter and now has to deal with the challenge of her son being detained and arrested. It's not my job to proclaim him innocent or guilty. Uh, he will go through the court process and if, if he is found to be guilty, he will be punished for, for what he has alleged to have done. Um, and I, I can only ask uh, and pray um, to God that this experience helps him to become a better person. On the lighter side of things, does Dr. Weekly miss teaching? And how does the family of the Virgin Islands Fort Premier feel about his new positioning? Yes, I, d I definitely uh, miss teaching. The, the best thing about it for me was the interaction between uh, teachers and students and um, something that I always miss. And I had a captive audience to laugh at or not laugh at my jokes. So that was uh, something that I do miss. But um, I enjoy what I do now. They've expressed that they're very proud. They've expressed that they support me. 100% uh, and I'm grateful for all my family support, my, my wife, my children, um, my mom, my dad, my siblings, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, everybody has expressed such great joy and great support. And even my, you know, my friends, uh, my colleagues, uh, persons I grew up with, I went to school with, all of them have been pouring in messages of support. And prayers for, for the territory, I must say. So many persons are praying for the territory. And those prayers are not falling on deaf ears. I know God hears our cries, and I, I believe very much that he'll deliver for us. I have to, you know, really recognize my brother. Uh, my brother has been by my side through this whole, or, whole ordeal, but he's been by my side my whole life. And um, I don't know what the people of the Virgin Islands would have done. Uh, without Mr. Benito Wheatley and he's he's still right there we're still working together because of course we the battle is not over we have to try our best to save our country and I'm grateful to have his his um, support and walking hard um, right alongside myself and the other members of our team uh, to, to pull us out of the jaws of of this very unwelcome situation 
we have seen uh, the acting skill of Suwande in the JTV Noel Lloyd documentary produced by our own Andrea Wilson. He followed Lloyd's advocacy and political career. He too fought against direct British rule. Its Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. the Honorable Natalia Wheatley, still inspired by the late great Noel Lloyd? Oh, every day. Every day. Uh, in so many different ways. Not just the match um, that, of course, he did against um, the, positive, the, uh, the, the positive action he took, um, the match against the Bates Hill Agreement um, w uh, with Wickham's Key and Anigata. Um, but not just that, he, he wrote a manuscript and the manuscript really outlined his political and economic philosophy. And it's one where Virgin Islanders can develop and grow and become masters of their own destiny, not only politically, but, but socially and economically. And it's something that, that drives me even today. And I'm grateful that as a government we've been able to implement uh, new national holidays, and in, uh, particularly in the Heroes and for Parents Day, we'll see even greater celebration of, of Noah Lloyd and the members of the Positive Action Movement. Chronicled, the political life of Dr. Natalio D. Whitley, also known as Sowande Hururu, Premier and Minister of Finance with responsibilities for fisheries and agriculture. With this special edition of The Big Story, Kathy Richards.